about a profession is that you must be knowledgeable in the subject and that you must have undergone some formal uh, training that makes you be recognized in that field as an expert or professional. So yes, that, that assumption is there. However, in the process of teaching, please, please, please don't ever make the learners feel like they are nothing because you are an expert in this area. Engage them because you are trying to uplift them so that they can just learn a bit of what you know. You know more, okay? But if you go with an attitude to show the learners that they know nothing completely, then you are putting them off because you are showing them that you know it all. So therefore, they are not important. But the teaching process is two-way. It's an art of engaging the learner together with the instructor. So if I come with an attitude of showing you to say, are you guys, you mean you don't know this, you don't know this, then what will happen is that you withdraw and therefore I will not get the best out of you. Remember, you are in, when you are teaching, you are trying to make everybody perform to the best of their ability. That's, that's your goal. Okay, so you want to see people get the best out of their ability from your guidance. So yes, the fact that you are a professional teacher standing in front of a class means that you have a level of expertise and you are qualified to take on that role. That is very important. But before you start teaching, know who you are teaching and what you are teaching them. Then find out what they know about that topic so that it's easy for you now to, what do I say, to formalize the concepts in such a way that it builds already on what they know. That is what teaching is supposed to be, in my view. Okay, so let's move to the next learning objective, which is purpose of teaching. So we need to be very clear why we are teaching a particular topic or subject. What is the purpose? Are you teaching the subject just for interest? Are you teaching the subject in order to achieve certain set goals? What do you want those people to do? Okay. So why teach? The first thing is teaching creates knowledge awareness and feelings in the thought and it brings about behavioral change. So the first thing to do is, you know that you know so much about this subject. They may not know as much, but they know something very well, little, okay? So now you create that knowledge awareness to say, do you know that this thing, you can even know about this, this thing is connected to this, okay? So now the moment they engage and they say, oh, all right. So if I have an equation, Okay, for example, I'm using this as an example. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with trigonometry, right? With trigonometry, what we normally do is we just use that right angle, the triangle, right? And we put X, Y, Z or something. And then we put Z on the hypothesis. Hypotenuse, sorry, on the hypotenuse. Then we say, okay, the square of Z is equal to the sum of the squares of x and y. Okay? And then you say, now I want to make a z as the subject. So I say, okay, x squared plus y squared is equal to z squared. So I say, divide the whole equation by z. Then what you have is that you have x squared over z squared plus y squared over z squared is equal to 1. And now you go back to the basics. You say, okay, opposite over hypotenuse is what? It gives you sine. Then adjacent over hypotenuse, it gives you cosine. So we use that to build all the trigonometric equations you can think of, okay? So this is what I'm trying to say. So when you are teaching, you create that awareness. And now everybody knows that, okay, if I know that x squared plus y squared is equal to z squared, with that I can derive all the trigonometric functions, then you are creating that awareness 
and feelings in the thought, and that brings about the behavioral change. So instead of worrying about memorizing all these cosines, cotangents, and everything, they'll just remember that thing, and using that thing, they can now bring the little they know together to derive all those things. That's what I'm talking about. So while you are teaching, you are trying to make it easier for people to create their own knowledge in such a way that they can actually willfully and willingly and enjoyably so apply it because they own it now. They understand the, the subject. OK, have I made myself clear there why we teach? The reason why we teach is just that. OK, so if, I have if you a, don't I have a question. Yes, sir. Yeah, I have a question on uh, the behavioral change because we have uh, emphasized a little bit on it. Yes, please. So for for courses, for example, if you are you are teaching someone how to teach, you can see the behavioral change maybe in how they they approach the lecture, how they interact with the students, and so on. From Correct from before they knew how to teach. Yes. Now, for some other courses or subjects like Max, for example, mm -hmm. you teach someone a, a course in Max or you, you teach someone something in physics, how would you define behavior or change in that case? I'll tell you, a teaching mathematics and, or and teaching any, sub, any science subjects, is a set of activities that you use to monitor behavioral change. So, for example, uh, when we were teaching at UNSA, I was teaching M110. M110, I was teaching 350 plus students in one lecture hall. So, I wouldn't monitor that behavioral change in what I've presented in class. We used to split them into uh, tutorial groups of no more than 25. Now, when you split them in those tutorial groups, you have a set of exercises which you give to the tutor to go and use to interact with them during that class. So you tell them to say, okay, out of your 25 students, I've got questions one to 10, for example, and then tell me how many in your tutorial groups are able to do questions one to five independently, how many of the people in your class are able to do five to 10 with the help of your, yourself. Then from there, with, with the feedback that the tutor brings back, you are able to see that now I've got at least 60% of my students who understand trigonometry, for example. Okay, that is the way. So when you are planning for teaching a subject like maths or physics, which are applied in nature, then the, the type of activities you set for the students to do is what will inform you into how their behavior has changed. Have I answered your question, DVC? Uh, yes, you have. Thank you, sir. Thank you. OK, then we can move. So now we know what teaching is. We know why we are teaching. So what is the process? Now we are interrogating the process. How do I go about teaching? That is now what we are going to look at, OK? So the teaching process has how many actors? You have yourself as a teacher, you have your message, and you have your students, OK? So remember, I did say in my previous um, lesson on this group, I said that the role of a teacher is actually three phases in a one lecture. You have get them in, meaning that you introduce the subject, you get the participants to engage with what you are going to teach. That's getting them in. So you draw their attention to what is being taught. OK. So they know this is what we are going to cover. OK, then you get on with it. So getting on with it now, you go through the process of teaching that material which you've prepared. OK, and then the last one is now you summarize and then see how they thought have responded, okay? So the teaching process starts with the teacher. The teacher needs to be well prepared and he must define as part of his ground rules 
that there are no communication barriers in his class. I don't know how many of us set these ground rules in class. You, you set your ground rules, lecture one. You tell them to say, right, I'm going to teach you this subject and I'm going to be the facilitator. But these are my ground rules. I want everybody to arrive on time. I want everybody to respect each other. And the famous quote that I use is that if somebody asks a question which you think is stupid, don't uh, laugh or make look at that person as being stupid. It's my job as a teacher to answer any question irrespective of whether it's stupid, intelligent, or destructive. Okay? So you, you set those ground rules, day one, lecture one. And then your message should be clear, accurate, brief, and specific. I don't, I mean, I, 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 I don't enjoy classes where we spend two hours, the lecturer is talking continuously. Concentration span doesn't exceed 10 minutes, okay, 10 to 15 minutes for every normal human being. I may be wrong, but I think that's roughly the estimate. And then while we are delivering that message, which is supposed to be clear, accurate, brief, and specific, you allow the thought also to engage so that they can respond to what you are saying and demonstrate to you whether they are being receptive or not. That is the process of teaching. Now, let's see how we make this work practically. So, this is the learning cycle, okay? You have the cognitive domain. This is where your intelligence is, where you learn things, you get to know things, you acquire knowledge, okay? And then you have these other domains, the psychomotor domain, which has to do with the way people respond physically or whatever, okay? Uh, practically, in other words, that is the being and the attitudes. So when we're talking about change of attitude, we are actually addressing the psychomotor domain. Then we've got the affective domain, which is doing, okay? The feelings, the practice, okay? Now, here we are. These things are there for us to know. This is the learning cycle. So how do we bring them together to make sure learning takes place? So that is what we need to tie together. OK, so the first thing to remember is the teacher learns while teaching. Tell me, what does the teacher learn while teaching? It's a fact the teacher learns while teaching, but what does the teacher learn? Yes, Mr. Chisongo, you've got your hand up. Yes, uh, from two two issues I could uh, mention, Doc, uh, is that yes, uh, one is um, as the teacher teaches, he might learn a little more in terms of um, the depth of the subject matter that he is or he or she is teaching. Okay. And then the second aspect I would probably mention is uh, there is there. Is, the, the response of the thought. So, so the teacher could right. learn also, yeah, the response is getting from the thought as to whether the teaching is actually effective or not. Okay. Thank you. Thank Dr. you. That, those are good points. Mr. Mkosa? Do, Dr. Mkosa, so uh, The teacher can also learn the behaviors mm -hmm. of uh, the thoughts especially that teaching is a process that uh, includes behavioral change. So the teacher can learn the behaviors of the thought and then come up with better methods of delivering the lessons because learners are different and they learn differently. So in preparing the teaching, the teacher must adapt these behaviors and see the best way of delivering. Yes, thank you very much. That's very deep as well. Uh, who had designed, is it? Who had designed up? Have you withdrawn? Uh, there was someone oh, else. Oh, Mr. Chulu, please. Yes, go ahead. 
just adding on the, the pre, what the previous speaker has said, uh, mm -hmm. during, the, during teaching, the teacher learns how to teach and teach better. Right. How does he learn those? By observing the response from the people who are being taught. And then he's Thank able to much. modify and change the methodology so that the, the teaching, which is creating awareness and the change of behavior, takes yes. place. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example before I go to Dr. Matoka. Uh, I had gone to observe one student in a very, I mean, one, one student teacher in a very difficult area of London. And this, this female, was a, this student was a female student. And then he, she started her lecture. She spoke for about 15, 10 to 15 minutes. And then one naughty boy just stands up. This person was talking about computer science. And this naughty boy just stands in the middle of the class. Madam, are you married? What does that tell you? How do you respond to such a thing? What does it tell you? What does it teach you? You have never had such experiences? Mr. Churu, okay, then before you go to Dr. Matoka, Mr. Churu, you have your hand up. Those experiences are there, sir, and uh, that is an example of distraction. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what causes it? Uh, sometimes, you know, the, 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 rece the reception of uh, how the child maybe is going through the lesson, he maybe is distracted by certain things, then he just wants to confuse this, the situation. So what does but that as you said, you? as a teacher, we are there to answer to every question, no matter how foolish, and we are there to control every behavior, no matter how outward. Yes, because that is your job. You know, because if that person, if you if you engage that person, that person will, will bring in a lot of other issues that are irrelevant and therefore distract you from uh, fulfilling your, your goal of making that subject be learned by the learners. So you can actually be thrown out of balance if you don't know how to manage such behavior. So you know the type of people you are teaching and their behavioral attitudes. So to change those, you must find an appropriate method of responding to such a, a disruptive question. Dr. Matoka, sorry I cut you short before you had something to say. Not at all, doctor. Thank you so much. In fact, it is in line with the, what you have talked about. Uh, I have okay. observed that uh, in almost every class of mine, you have some students that are very dominant and they want to contribute at every stage. And then you have Thank those, you. you have those that may not actually contribute for the entire two hours you are there. Then you have yes, another yes. set that may be very, very noisy. Even when you are delivering, they are chatting between or among themselves. Yes. So in the process, you are forced to learn how to deal with different situations. Uh, th that is what I thought uh, I, I could share. I have learned now to handle dominant students and uh, allow the others that are not so dominant to also participate. So you psychologically keep those that are dominant quiet and then yes. try to trigger participation from those that are very, very quiet. So you, you keep learning in the process. That's what I wanted to say, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That is the way, you see, because you are not just teaching the subject, you are also managing the learning environment and then consistently trying to keep your learners on track because if you can't control these behaviors you lose track of what you intended to teach and whether learning has taken place or not so the teacher is constantly learning while teaching okay so basically what i'm trying to say here is that teaching equips cognitive domain with knowledge and psychomotor domain with feelings and interest 
So these are important because if you engage both the cognitive domain and the psychomotor domain, then you will know whether these students are actually interested in the subject and they are engaging with the subject matter or not. Okay. Both these domains affect the affective domain to do practice or to do or not do practice. Okay. So if if these two domains are not there, the doing part will not happen. Okay. So when we say get them in, we are trying to say let them know what they are going to learn and then let them get the interest from their own inner self to say, yes, this is what I want to know. You know, like you, at the university, you are going to introduce a topic like calculus. Students come to come to the university with all this uh, information from their predecessors that when you go to the university, the calculus separates men from women. You know, then they start saying, oh, yes, yes, let me prove that I can learn calculus. Then I'm a university student material. So that, that challenge in itself will make students actually want to know what is involved in the calculus. So they know the subject matter to say the calculus has to do with this. Then they say, ah, oh, yes, I've heard about calculus. Now I'm, I'm interested in knowing calculus. So now the moment you give them something, they now want to, to prove that they can actually solve calculus problems, okay? So if this practicing of teaching is done on a regular basis with a positive feeling, liking for the subject, subject will be internally absorbed and retained by the student. So this process is called internalization. So when, the, when your learners internalize the subject matter, they own it practically, we must demonstrate that we can do this. Then you have got them in strongly and your teaching will be very interesting. So whenever it is needed, the cognitive domain provides or recalls the stored facts and concepts automatically, so that becomes automatism. So then one can profess about the subject. I will give you an example. We had a very famous teacher at Hillcrest. Uh, his name was Mr. Rajaman. Very, very famous man. He did a lot. Uh, one of the things that he liked, he liked to talk about is joking about caning. Though he never caned anybody in, in, in our period, he never caned anybody. What he used to say is that, you see, boys, the mind is always willing, but the flesh is weak. So when we can the flesh, we are trying to make it to cooperate with the mind. Okay, So, so that's what we are trying to do. But he never caned anybody. So he would just tell you to say, I know your mind is willing, but you are just being lazy, boys, you, with your flesh. Your flesh can do, but if you don't engage it, then we will not achieve what you want. Your mind is willing, I know. So he was always uh, talking about that. You know, your mind is always willing. And this teacher would even come on a Sunday when he knows we have prep. He knows we are all, we're all boarders. So he would come, you have prep from 14 to 16 hours. And then he comes and says, there is one topic I didn't teach properly. And he starts teaching. You don't have a timetable, he didn't obey. But he knew that I didn't teach this subject properly, and he comes and starts teaching. So that's the level of commitment some teachers have. I don't know how many of us can do that. So now this comes to us now. A professor in French is basically a teacher. So who is a professor? So the origins of this term is that we are saying, once the affective domain is enriched with knowledge and positive attitude, internalization of the subject, the subject will be assimilated to occur. So that is what happens, okay? So if you understand that uh, the cognitive domain recognized, recognizes the subject matter, the knowledge they want to acquire, and the learner adopts a, a positive attitude, then the affective domain will respond to what has to be done, okay? So internalization will lead to development of automatism, recording the concepts and the facts about subject matter and command over the subject. Then he can profess about the subject. That's how you become a professor. So if you can't engage your learners at that level, no matter how knowledgeable you are, you will not be an effective teacher in class. So 
if we say the precursor to teaching is making sure you know how to engage your subjects towards the subject you want to teach and then how to entice them to develop a positive attitude towards that subject, then your students will willingly learn that subject. That's basically what we are talking about. So you can teach the subject even the whole day because you've captured those two important aspects of their learning process. You can teach the whole day, you will not find anybody dozing as long as you change types of methods. Okay. So are there any questions at this point, ladies and gentlemen? Any thoughts, any suggestions, any experiences? The whole idea is let's share what we know so that we can enrich our teaching practice in the university. So some universities are known for good teaching and we could be one of them, okay? Where you, students just feel when you go, their subjects are well taught. And that can be our point of strength, our setting point. Any questions, any suggestions? Let's work together. We share ideas, that's the key. Okay, learning, learning objective number four. Types of, oh, Dr. Mkosta, you had your hand up. Go ahead, sir. Yes, yes, Doc, I wanted to find out. Is mm -hmm. there a situation where uh, learner behavior does not allow a teacher to impart knowledge. And if, he, if that exists, then mm -hmm. what does the teacher do? Right. I'll tell you one thing. Yes, learner behavior can actually disrupt the learning. Okay. Now, for us in the university, trust me, never get into conflict with the disruptive students. Manage them. And you've got so many ways and techniques that we are going to cover that will help you manage learner behavior. The last thing you can ever do is to say, you are being naughty in my class, I'll report you to the DVC. Never do that. Because the moment that student's behavior is controlled at that level, it will become a daily occurrence in your class. So every time you'll be sending him to the DVC. Now, <laughs> how will the DVC view you? In, in some not, teachers, we always say, pardon? Not quite, Doc. Uh, let me, not quite that. You see, maybe let me ask <laughs> my, 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 my question plainly. Are yes. there some behaviors that are, you know, sometimes there are behaviors that are not willing to learn. Eh? Mm -hmm. There are such experiences where some behaviors are just not willing to learn. You sit this student down, you go out of your way, look, do this, look, be concerned. And then you notice the behavior is, uh, is, is, is just not aligning with the learning environment. I, maybe let me say, are there a situation where, uh, do the untaught exist? Maybe let me say that. <laughs> no, the, the, I don't want to assume the untaught exist. So what you want to do there is this, okay? Find out the motivation for that person enrolling on that course, first of all when you see that they are not willing to engage with any subject matter that you present, right? So find out the motivation for them coming on that course and what their expectations of that course are, okay? So throw them out of the box because when, when, when they are being disruptive in your class, you cannot spend all the time dealing with them. So throw them out of the box and engage them separately possibly with another independent person, such as a counselor or something in your office, in a diff different environment. So throw them out of that teaching environment, first of all, and then engage them at that personal level. Because you are seeing that that disruption is nothing to do with what you are teaching, but it's the preparedness of the learner to take that subject or not take it. Because if somebody says, I don't want to take this subject, no matter how well you teach it, their mind is set, you can't, you can't do anything. Have I answered your question? Yes, thank you very much, Doc. Very, very helpful. I'm dealing with a situation right now, and I think I'm I'm relating this to what is happening. 
I'm dealing with a particular student that um, says, I've cancelled this student several times, and this student says, I was actually forced to enroll into university. So I called the parents because I know them, and we sat down, myself, yes, the learner, and the parents, and I explained to them that this student doesn't want to learn. It seems like you forced them. So the parents right. haven't heeded to the advice and the poor student is in limbo. You can see that they are not there even when they come to class. Mm, that, that is a difficult. But thank you for the response, Doc. I, I've really learned. Okay, thank you. Yeah, they take them out of the chiller so that they don't affect the other people. So I, I, I move, on, move on to the types of teaching. Okay. Remember when we talked about curriculum design, we talked about the way the teacher perceives teaching is having an effect on how they perform in class. OK, so the types of teaching. First of all, you have active uh, teaching or active learning. So the active methods allow you to engage the learners actively. Don't want don't go to a lecture that will last for two hours. You are just the only one talking. Students have no activity. No. There, you are actually tempting them to become disruptive. Go to a lecture, expose the main concepts, give them some activity, or maybe engage them in question and answer or discussion topic. They give you some of the ideas, and then you build on some of the ideas, even recognizing some of the positive things they've contributed to the topic in order to advance to the next stage. That way, you can have a class working with you maybe for two, three hours you won't have any challenge, okay? Because students are actively involved and in some of that debate they engage in or the question and answer things they do make them actually start even thinking more about what else they know about this and they bring out a lot of things, okay? So in modern teaching, we are actually emphasizing on active teaching methods and that's what we are going to emphasize on in this course. Then you have got those teacher-centered methods of teaching, which we call passive teaching methods. Those methods are not productive because no matter how well you know the subject, how well your notes, your notes are prepared, as long as the student is not involved in doing something around the subject, they'll just listen to you and then when they leave, they've forgotten. Okay? Uh, so basically these two types of teaching methods uh, can only be distinguished by classifying them as learner oriented, which means active methods are learner oriented, and then passive methods are teacher oriented. You are not there to show the students how much you know. So, teacher oriented methods are outdated. Okay. They may work at very, very low levels of education, but at high levels of education, no, they are totally archaic. Okay. So this brings me to learning objective number five, which are methods of teaching. Pedagogy, really, we are going to cover all these things. The eight learning objectives I've given you will inform the eight uh, topics that we are going to cover. So this is what we are going to do throughout the course. So methods of teaching. Let's start by just uh, having a basic discussion. What do you consider as methods of teaching? When somebody tells you to say there are different methods of teaching, what comes to your mind or what does that tell you? Mr. Chulu. Your views, yes. sir. Yes. Go ahead, sir. Uh, uh, th these are tactics that are used eh, in delivering the content eh, that a teacher has prepared. For example, Thank I've already you. mentioned eh, there's a question and the answer, oh, but also the lecture method and many others mm -hmm. that are practical 
Sama Pasi, who was your saint. Thank you very much. I like the way that you've used tactics of teaching. Okay, because really when you are teaching, you cannot use one tactic throughout the lecture. Okay. There are some tactics that work, there are some tactics that don't work. So depending on what subject you are teaching, who you are teaching, and the level of engagement, and also the level of motivation of the learners, the tactics that you use change, okay? So if I find that my students are struggling with a particular topic, for example, or a particular item in my, in my lecture, instead of me start pointing them one by one, I simply change to say, okay, Guys working in groups of three or two, or three of three, or two, two or three. Okay, let's let's reorganize. Okay, you sit there, you look into this. You sit there, you look into this. So I start walking around now. I start seeing who has grasped that aspect, who hasn't, by just listening to them as they are working in a group. That's a change of tactic, because my explaining to them is not getting across to them, and I've realized that that is not working. So I change the strategy to make them engage with the subject matter more than listening to me, okay? So methods of teaching are a set of tactics or strategies that you use to enforce learning, okay? You, you don't have to tell them that I'm using this method now. I mean, no, 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 you, it's you now learning to see how best can these people learn the given subject. So you change your tactics accordingly, okay? So I'm, I'm, I'm just showing you some examples of teaching methods there. So the first one, which we all know is the lecture method, lecture discussion, seminar, symposium, panel discussion, group discussion, tutorials, role play, integrated teaching, which can be horizontal or vertical, talking point sessions, workshops, conferences, and so on. There are a number of these teaching methods. I may not be exhaustive in here, but as you learn more, you, 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 as you practice more, not just necessarily learning, as you practice more, you come across even more teaching methods. Okay, so it's important to be, it's important to know or to be aware that in any lecture, I can use a variety of these teaching methods. I'm not forced to be lecturing all the time. I'm not forced, depending on the environment and who I'm teaching, I can employ any of these tactics. Obviously, there are certain things that are restrictive. For instance, you are teaching 350 uh, students in a class. You cannot start doing role play. You cannot start doing panel discussion. You have to convey the important things first. And then from there, you can split the class into smaller groups and change your teaching strategies. Okay. As I said, we shall cover a lot of those explicitly in this course. Okay. So, I've gotten up to learning objective five, which is methods of teaching. Do we have any questions before I go to the next one? Any questions, ideas, contributions? Mr. Amdenda, you have been very quiet. Any suggestions? I'm following. It's exciting. Sure, you, you don't want to suggest something that we can add to enrich our learning experience together as a team? Okay, let's go to qualities of good teaching. Now, the first thing that most of us struggle with is, how do you know that you are teaching well? You had this class two hours you're teaching a very interesting subject that you love so much. You, you go to this class, you deliver that class. One and a half hours, you give them 30 minutes to do some exercise. And then you go back to your office. How do you know whether you're doing well or not? Do we engage in what I call reflective practice? I finished teaching now. I go and sit back in my office. I start thinking, hmm, how did that lecture go? Did I capture the student's attention? 
can I be confident that if I set an exam question on that paper, on, on that topic, students will pass it? You are sitting on your own, you're finished teaching. What are the things that you look into your teaching to see whether you can say, yeah, that was a good lecture, I've done it. Any thoughts? Yes, Mr. Chul. Mr. Chulu, then I'll go to Mr. Webster's Kazu. Mr. Chulu, you had your hand up first. Sorry, sir. You engage what is, in what is called the reflective practice, which is sometimes is called the evaluation. So this evaluation, just when you when you started the, the, the lesson or the class, there are some things that you 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 put you put down the way you have done, you have given us the objectives. Things that we are able to we we, we we should be able to grasp, things that we should be able to practice, things that we should be able to be seen to do at the end of the lesson. So when the lesson ends, you evaluate, which means you look at the outcome. Have I achieved what I intended to change in these learners? So you you evaluate the learners as well as yourself. So there is it. Uh, learner evaluation and teacher evaluation at the end. These will help us to to see whether we are we are quality we have the qualities of good teaching. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Stazwe. Yes. Um, sometimes how I evaluate uh, uh, whether what I was teaching. Uh, uh, has sunk in with my learners is uh, mm -hmm. I think sometimes you can see the response eh? uh, yes. from from your learners uh, because uh, uh, if uh, the was so immense in your in your course eh? in your topic uh, what they'll do at the end is that sometimes uh, the questions will keep on flooding in eh? uh, mm -hmm. so you you can even gauge that, that level of interest that uh, you have spiked in them the level of your mm -hmm. curiosity. Uh, how you see, you know that you have not made an impact is uh, uh, the opposite uh, 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 response, eh? where uh, even when you ask uh, uh, any questions or uh, uh, any comments, uh, it's completely quiet. Uh, then perhaps you feel that maybe this time I did not make an impact. Okay, thank you very much. So, as I said, when you are teaching, the teacher is constantly learning. So all those things that you, you are you seeing, the behaviors that you see amongst your learners while you are teaching, will inform you whether learning is taking place or not. Okay? There are small things that learners will do that will tell you to say they are not with you here. And you must constantly be observant. You, you must be constantly observant because there are certain things, certain behavioral traits, that will tell you to say you are talking to yourself. OK, so now let's look at the criteria of good teaching. OK, the first thing which is definitely important is good concept. Thorough preparation. Don't ever go to class and prepared, no matter how intelligent you are. You want to teach well. OK, so you are going to teach a topic thoroughly prepare so that even when you talk to students, they think you are actually serious about what you are teaching and you are ready to teach, okay? The next thing is organized content. Your prepare, part of your preparation should also include how you organize content to be delivered in that particular lesson. This is lesson planning, okay? So that organized content includes the, the actual subject content, the teaching aids, any tools that you want to involve to support your teaching, and so on. Okay. So this is the criteria of good teaching. You must have those. Okay. And then don't over prepare good quality and optimum quantity. There is no need for me to come to class 
within an hour, I introduce 20 different concepts. How many of those 20 concepts will the students assimilate in one hour? Okay, so when you prepare, just gauge your time and see how much learners can take in within that given time. Okay, so you must organize good quality content and optimal quantity. Don't over teach. Then the sequence in which you, you sequence your material, what we've talked about coming from the unknown, I mean, from the already known, moving towards what you aspire to know, okay? So the sequence should follow that. Once they grasp this fully, they will move to this concept. Once they get this concept, they can apply it at this level, and this is where I want them to, to be. And your materials should be relevant to the subject you are, you are teaching. I've seen a lot of people, and these are unprepared teachers, right? Who go in class, they spend 30 minutes talking about football. And then the last 10 minutes, that's when they talk about the subject matter. Now, you may think students are interested in football and they are listening to you, but you are missing the point. That's not the right place to discuss football. What is the relevance of this, this topic to the learners at that particular time? One of the things that we were taught in the UK was that whenever you go to a class, because the UK has people from all over the world, people with different religious orientations, people from different cultural backgrounds, people from different countries where certain things are bored upon, certain things do, do not matter. Okay, So you don't go to class discussing politics, discussing religion, discussing ethnicity, or discussing whatever jokes that do not relate to the subject. Stick to the relevancy of your subject. If you want to discuss those issues, go and discuss with your friends. But the class is not the place. Okay? And one of the things that you should always do is that whatever you're talking about should be learner-oriented, not showing off how much you know. Okay? You tell them to say, you know, if you if you understand this well, you can apply to this, so that the learner now can see the value of what you are teaching them towards what they can do after the class. Okay, so these are a summary of what we call criteria of good teaching. If you are aware of this and you do them constantly, your students will have respect for you. You will have no problems. Okay, so. Before I go to the next concept, how many of us do this, or what are our experiences in doing this? Can I comment? Mr. Uh, no. Yes. Uh, just a comment, uh, especially on the, the third bullet about the uh, uh, optimum Good quality. quantity. Yes. yes. Uh, uh, most of us use uh, uh, PowerPoint slides to deliver our mm -hmm. teaching. Eh? Uh, but yes. um, I think uh, an observation is that sometimes uh, uh, where you are teaching and then uh, uh, the slides, because they're able to show uh, slide one of uh, uh, 57. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so immediately your students, when they see that, uh, sometimes it puts them off. Right? But my God, uh -huh. <laughs> I'm going to finish this topic. So uh, would you say that perhaps a good practice would be to try and uh, uh, the, cut up your, your slides into yes. uh, more manageable bits so that uh, it does not put off your, your learners. Thank you. No, I'll, I'll give you an example. When I talked about curriculum design on Tuesday, I had so many things to talk about, but I cut the size of the jacket to say, in this period, I am covering this. I didn't cover more than 20 slides, okay? I had a point of termination, right? So there might be all these slides, but they are not for that lecture, okay? So you cut the, the jacket to the size of the, the slot that you are delivering. Then when you come next time, you do a quick recap on those things that you did. You are using the same set of slides. You do a quick recap of what you said up to that point where you cut off. Then you can now continue the rest. So it's, it's what you prepare to deliver within the given time. Yes, Mr. Mdenda.
Mr. Mdenda, you had your hand up, please. Unmute and talk. Uh, I am saying that at other times we take life for granted. Uh -huh. And the lesson is coming at the right time. Also, under the pressures of this world, at other times you go to class feeling that you know the content but you didn't have optimum preparation. I think it is worthwhile these things that we are looking at. You may have a rough sequence. I think for me it is beneficial, really. It is a wake up call. Thank you very much, sir. Mr. Msona? Yeah, um, I would like to comment on the optimum quantity uh, with yeah. respect to the content that should be on a, a single slide. How many yeah. lines should you have on a single slide? From what I remember um, mm -hmm. when I did this kind of thing, is that no more than eight lines. Because if you put more than eight lines, the slide mm -hmm. becomes like a book and it puts Go off yes. the learners. Even yourself, you can even miss. You can even be missing what is written on those slides because it's cluttered. Okay. Sure. Make the points simple. Because you prepared it, you can elaborate on each of those points. Okay. So, yes, the optimum quantity and the presentation really matters. I want to put up a slide which people can read, and then they can, they can glance at the slide and then listen to what I'm going to say. Mr. Mwape, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, Doc, thank you for the opportunity. I, I like the first two bullets. I've I found one of the winning formula is uh, preparation. Yes. Uh, a good preparation uh, really works uh, very well. Uh, I, was, I was trying to, to lecture on, on, on certain concepts on the taxation today to students. And, you know, these students are lawyers and they are not so yes. much used to numbers uh, right. so that 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 works a bit strange they were never expecting but they find themselves discussing tax law but mm -hmm. when you are prepared and you have got organized content it be becomes very easy even the very lowest student who thought could not handle numbers begins to handle numbers and their enthusiasm about it you know, just works well. In the afternoon, I've been receiving uh, messages and on the question that I had actually left them, and I see many answers that are coming and working towards what we were discussing. So I, I just thought to appreciate what you have mentioned, the good concept in thorough preparation and also organized content. It, it gives quite a logic, you know, understanding to students as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Madam Prudence. Madam Prudence, your hand is up. Yes, Doc. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I also just wanted to say something, you know, um, just agreeing with you uh, on the point that uh, Mr. Skazi raised about good mm -hmm. quality and optimum quantity, um, where you have maybe quite a lot of slides. Because that's mm. usually I see that in my students on some of the um, of of the lessons that we give them, it find their slides are quite long, and so usually mm -hmm. you can even see them at a point where they are losing interest. So yes. usually for me, like you said, I take a break, I'll break. Mm. I can see that they are losing interest, and I'll take a break, and then I would try and bring out maybe some questions or try to hear the views of what they have uh, what they have learned, and I'll get these mm -hmm. uh, responses, and then maybe um, give them even a small break, and then out of that, I would maybe get a question or two, uh, mm -hmm. which in my planning, when I was like looking at point A and B, I know these slides are long before I even go and see them. So sometimes I do have these questions that I put aside when I know at this point, I'm sure they will they will feel like they can't contain anymore. So we need to take a break. Mm -hmm. And when we, we when we break, maybe yes, I get to ask them questions, 
hear the response. And then from there, I know if they can still take some more or not. And then maybe I would say, OK, um, let's have uh, these questions that we are going mm -hmm. to maybe do in groups just to you no, know, I put yes, them in right. groups just to not let them feel, you know, um, like it, they're, they're being uh, they have a lot of weight to carry and I'll tell them to mm -hmm. discuss. Yes, and mm -hmm. then I'll give them some time. So after that, then I will I'll give them after giving them some time, I'll bring them back together and say, OK, let's now hear your views. So now I get to listen to them while they are talking. <laughs> yeah, Thank so that they much. just yeah, they they don't doze or they don't sleep or they don't go out of uh, out of the lesson. Thank you very much. Those are positive engagement tactics, yes, because you want you have seen that these people are probably getting bored with this. You change the activity, okay? So you change your tactics. You give them something that moves them away from that monotony. They engage into something which they probably find more interesting. Mr. Chul. Very much, Joe. I feel um, thank you very yes, much, Joe. I feel I can't hold this point. Of yes, course, sir. change of tactics. Sometimes it could be a simple activity. This experience where I felt because of my subject involved a lot of theoretical theories. Mm -hmm. So I was using the students and I just came up with a quiz. Five yes, thank questions, you. yes or no, yes or, yes or no, mm -hmm. yes or no. And then at the end, they mark themselves and they came back mm -hmm. into the, the lesson. But on the criteria of a good, good teaching, I think uh, uh, good teaching comes with the consistent learning. So a good teacher mm -hmm. is a consistent learner. This has helped me for the many years that I've been teaching. I find that when I am teaching and learning, uh, my teaching is very good. Every yes, after some five years, some, I just want to, a teacher, for, for, for a teacher to be good, must have a thirst for knowledge. And that is going Correct. to make the teacher to even know more than the student. And that is what is Thank expected. You. The teacher must know more than the student. It doesn't matter the field sometimes. There are times when mm -hmm. I thought, mm, I've been teaching without learning. I even go into religion. I get a qualification there. And I, I <laughs> increase to the knowledge that I have. I have done that before. So good teaching is about uh, being consistent in learning, learning about what you are doing as a teacher, but also increasing even knowledge. No, knowledge, yes. Thank you very much. Bro. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Now, to, to practice what we've been talking about, I'll take a break, two minutes break, just two minutes, and then in, let us reflect on how to teach, because this is a practice that we do. I'll just give two minutes break. Please, let's have gather our thoughts on how to teach before we continue. Uh, just two minutes. Yes, my vote is ending. So we are breaking some of our standard rules. Eh? Optimally, 
You are not supposed to be teaching for more than two hours. Eh? You lose your students. Do we subscribe to that philosophy? Yes, we do. So we are losing it ourselves here. <laughs> no, it's exciting. Yeah. Because uh, of the engagement, it is exciting. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So let's 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 uh, reflect on how to teach. How do we go about the process of teaching? We have known the criteria of what constitutes good teaching. So how do you go about practicing that in a lesson, how to teach? Any thoughts, any ideas? Yes, Mr. Mdenda, your hand is up. Go ahead, Mr. Mdenda, unmute and speak. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Okay, go ahead, sir. The beginning point was where you began from. That okay. broadly speaking, there are two broad ways. You may have mm -hmm. teacher-centered or yes. learner-centered. My right. take-home point is that you can use a number of tactics, but generally need to be learner-focused. An example okay. is this session we, where we are right now, which is interactive. You are the teacher, you are not dominating. The participants, mm -hmm. the learners are involved and therefore they can't lose interest. And the interest and the desire to continue learning keeps on being stimulated when the teaching is renaissanced. I submit. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much. Any other thoughts, ladies and gentlemen? How to teach? We know all the theory. How do we go about the art of teaching? So, uh, These are some of the ideas. A quick, uh, sorry, Contribution. let me just make a quick co comment. Yes, sir. Uh, like they say, failing to plan is planning to fail. Correct. So when you are a teacher and mm -hmm. uh, you are asking us this question, how to teach, I think the, mm -hmm. the most important thing is that uh, you must plan what it is you are going to teach. So you must come up Thank with you. a lesson plan that will guide you in terms of how you are going to proceed, what will come, when, where, why, and so on. So a lesson mm -hmm. plan will, will help you to teach effectively and efficiently. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, the lesson plan, although we don't mandate it at high education level, but indirectly, when a teacher prepares, we know that there is a plan behind it. You may not explicitly have the lesson plan displayed on your desk, but from the way you organize your slides, the time you allocate to each of the uh, slides will show what your plan of engagement is. So here are the things that I just thought maybe we, we highlight about teaching practice, how we teach. OK, the first thing is obviously you bring in these students for the first time. They don't know what you're going to discuss. OK, so if you've got a scheme of work, you display the scheme of work week by week. So they know this is week three. The topic is this. OK, so you just introduce that, that, that subject. OK, so that is the induction. OK, you get them in. You, you, you tell them what is going to be covered. OK, and how they're going to engage in that particular class. Not all classes are the same. 
So that induction tells them how they are going to work with you in that particular session. Then you introduce the topic. OK. When introducing your topic, you may even gather some uh, knowledge about what they know about that topic by just doing a simple question and answer. OK, then from there now, after doing the simple question and answer, you know you have a rough idea as to how much they know about this topic. So now, if you realize that they are completely in the dark, you reorganize your topic, maybe by doing a recap of something that you've done before. You do a recap, see how that recap brings them to the level of understanding your topic appropriately. Then you organize the rest of the topic to say, I'll cover this concept, I'll cover this concept, I'll cover this concept. Then you start that process now. After you've covered the material, you start the process of reinforcing, okay, or stimulating to make sure that they keep relating what they know to what you are guiding them towards. And once you are satisfied that the level of engagement is satisfactory for you and that your learning has taken place, then you summarize the activities for that day. And that is what it is. Remember the three things I said I talked about, get them in. OK, get on with it and then get them out. So get them in, that's setting the induction. Get on with it, two, three, four. Get them out, summarizing, and you end the topic. OK, so at the end of the day, you should have a rough and red picture as to whether you have moved them from where they were to where you expected them to be at the end of the topic. So this is teaching practice in a nutshell. What are your experiences? Where are the challenges in this process, the teaching practice? How many of us do this on a topic by topic basis? Mr. Katebe, you haven't said anything. Oh, Ms. Samsona, your hand is up. Yes, please. Mr. Samsona, unmute and speak. You can see your hand is up. Yeah, I was saying that uh, reinforcing or stimulating is a very difficult one because mm -hmm. um, it, 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 when, when you are delivering learning, you mm -hmm. who, you are talking to students. Some of them may be distracted by their colleagues or the noise outside. Now, to keep them stimulated is quite a challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in my view. Yes, I, I know it's quite a challenge, but that is where the skill of a teacher lies. I, I'll tell you something. Um, mm. When you are teaching a large group, for example, you are teaching people in our largest lecture theater is one, two, three, one, two, four, right? Yeah. One, two, three, one, two, four. You have got that lecture theater filled up, okay? And you are trying to explain a concept and you find that the eastern corner, there is some noise coming from there, right? Uh, you can see that the noise coming from there is affecting the other people in the middle who are quiet, okay? What are you going to do? Instead of shouting to say, you guys that side, shut up, okay? Just do proxemics. Move up the aisle and get close to that, to that group that is talking. And then raise your voice a bit to try and reinforce the concept that you are explaining. So you might even move up there and say, I might not have been very audible from that end. The point I'm trying to make is this. So now, when those people see you come there, obviously they will know you have realized what they are doing is not ideal for the class. Their behavior will change immediately. Okay? Thank you. So you can use any opportunity like that to reinforce or stimulating the, the class. Have I answered your question, sir? Yes, you have. Thank you very much. Yeah, so when you are teaching in large classes, Handling things like that, you use proxemics. 
Okay, so I can see that these people are not engaging. I move closer to that point and I start explaining. I will not say shut up because the moment I say shut up, they, they will know that now we've got him. They will use that to say, mm -hmm. and then you, you know, the rest of the class join and then you, all those who are bored gang up. So what you do is you just reinforce. You have noticed that destructive behavior, but don't make it an issue. Okay. Just continue with what you're saying and you just say, oh, maybe when I was talking from that point, I may not have been very audible, but the point I was trying to make is this. So you see that they quieten up. Mr. Katewe, I had, yes, I had asked well, about your thoughts. Yes, uh, good evening. Good evening, sir, how are you? I'm okay, thank you. Um, I'm following quite closely. Uh, my, uh, experience or practice, um, um, particularly with the uh, bigger groups, is that um, you very much have to be in command in terms Thank of uh, ensuring that uh, the students are following you. It's very easy when you are when you are handling a bigger class uh, for students to be distracted either by their friends, the gadgets that they have, mm -hmm. and the like. So time and again, you find that students start making noises, are chatting among themselves and the like. So normally what I do is if there's a section that uh, uh, seems not to be concentrating, I may either go closer to that particular section and maybe just pose a question uh, mm -hmm. to check whether they are in class or not, or I may you know, stop what I'm doing and just look in the direction. Then everyone will see that, okay, I think uh, he is trying to get our attention and they would, you know, uh, concentrate like that. Yeah. Then the one more thing uh, which is very important uh, is that um, time and again, you should be able to pose questions about the contents that you are delivering just to try and check whether they are following or not. And uh, I do uh, normally even give them hints to say, on a section like this, you expect questions from this angle or that angle just to, to stimulate um, uh, interest from uh, from the students. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, actually, thank you. Thank you very much. You have raised two very important concepts that I may have not touched. You know, when you are teaching a class, eye contact with the students shows them that you know what is going on around the, the whole room. OK, don't focus yourself like you're just talking to people in front or you are talking to one or two students there. No, you move around and focus on things. You know, you look in different directions so that they can see you have an ego's view of the whole class. OK, so like he's saying, when you think that these people are making noise, you may move close there and just keep quiet. Then everybody will say, ah, what is he going to say next? So those who are talking now, We'll keep quiet as well, okay? The other thing that you will also capture students' attention, particularly those who are distracted when they want to disrupt others, is just bringing the issue of assessment, okay? To say, you know, for topics like this, we normally would want to, you know, assess you in this particular, particular way. Now, because assessment touches their progression, everybody wakes up to say, oh, is he telling us about what is going to come? No, no, you are not telling them what is going to come. You are just reinforcing the concepts by saying, in assessments, we may examine this topic from these angles. So students' interest is captured there. Thank you very much. And then the importance of summarizing. Yes, Mr. Chisongo. Yes, Doc. Um, just uh, a quick one. In the current uh, scenario nowadays, uh, there is proliferation of the use of these electronic gadgets and you know phones and iPads and all that. So I mm -hmm. wanted to find out, uh, as as an educational expert, uh, to what extent are we supposed to allow the use or admission of these gadgets into class, or the extent to which students can actually use them whilst they are in class? Um, we're trying to balance between the environment we find ourselves nowadays as well as you know giving the students the liberty that they, they sometimes may deserve uh, just wanted your comments on that okay 
my 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 comment is this one of the things that you don't want to do is to be a policeman in your own class okay so what you do is the ground rules are this you are coming to class one of the disruptive behaviors is phones ringing while i'm teaching okay so the first thing is it's a ground rule when you come to class i'm not picking the phone away from you but to make sure your phones are on silent because a phone ring in the middle of a class is disruptive okay so if you want to be smart you could actually do this the first few weeks huh, of the class when you come you, you stand in front there to say i'm about to teach now i'm about to start teaching let me put my phone on silent if there is anyone with a phone let us do the same you do that three four times it becomes routine okay so now obviously when the phone is on silent and the student is trying to google or doing whatever you can see what they are doing because they will be putting their face down not engaging you so the eye contact will make them realize that uh, actually you are not they are not in with you so you can if you know them by name you can even say ah, but John, you are looking down i thought maybe i would see you contribute on this topic or something okay so you are not you are not being a policeman but you are also not allowing them to do things that will disrupt what you are teaching them have I answered your question? Yes, Doc, uh, that's uh, fair enough. Thank you. Sure. So the importance of summarizing, I was getting to that last point. The importance of summarizing is actually to catch the attention, even those who could have missed one or two things. OK, they could have said, oh, what did he talk about? Then you simply say, in summary, in this lecture, we have covered the following. A, B, C, D, and you go through them sequentially. And then while you are summarizing, you can even do a question and answer, okay? So that your summary does not become a monotony of what you are saying. So you say, we touch this topic, okay? What are your thoughts on this topic? You pick one student, they give a summary of that piece. Then you move on to the next one. And then from there, keep your summary as short as possible. And then if it's a well-planned lecture, relate, your summary to what is going to be discussed in the next topic. OK, so that when you start the next topic, all you do is you re do a recap on the previous topic and then you tell them, as I said in that lecture, our next topic will cover this. So there is that sequential flow of activities which students can follow and build on their previous knowledge. OK, does, does that make sense? So I'm just going through this, each of these points one by one to to, to to just elaborate what I've been saying. So bring the mood of the audience into topic into the topic that is set in action. Make sure that your audience is ready to receive the message you are going to deliver by any means, which will make them attentive and receptive, like verbal questioning, handouts, problem exercises. So this set in action is what I called get them in. OK, once you've done this, you're bringing the mood of the audience into the topic. So you are making sure that your audience is ready to receive the message you are going to deliver by any means, which will make them attentive and receptive. So you're capturing those first two points. OK, once you get them in now, you can get on with it. Okay? So now getting on with it is now talking about those points I talked about here. I said here. I said set induction so that we get them in. Then get on with it. That's introducing topic, topic organization, reinforcing and stimulating. Then get them out. That's summarizing. That's basically what I'm saying there. Okay. So now, here now, introduction to the topic. Now you've gotten them in. You are sure these people are, are going to be receptive to what you are going to discuss. So discuss what you told them you are going to discuss. Don't digress, but stick to the subject matter. Introduce the, the topic to the students by means of title, learning objectives, performance objectives. And then organizing the topic, prepare lesson plan, keeping in mind relevance, sequence, editing, and time management. Now, time management is very key. Don't spend too much time on one concept and little time on the other. Okay. 
they, they, will, they will not see the essence of you having sequenced things the way you did. Okay, so manage your time on each topic appropriately. Okay, so where you think the students are having a bit of a challenge, you do more reinforcing, but don't overdo it. Because the more time you spend on that particular topic, regurgitating the same thing over and over, those who have grasped it first time will lose interest because to them they've understood it. So the more you keep rambling on the same topic, you get you lose those because they get bored. Okay. Then reinforcement, make the lesson both comprehensive and interesting by reinforcing with facts and figures, problems and exercises, giving examples. It's actually very, very important, particularly for us teaching at higher education level, to give relevant examples, if possible, real life industrial examples, so that students can see the full application of what you are teaching them into the real world. That is very important. Don't just ramp on theoretically, and one of the things, I, I, I'll, I'll hate to say this, but I'll say it. One of the things is, it's a terribly big mistake to go in class and be reading lecture notes from a book or from your prepared set of notes. It's a terribly big mistake. You can glance at what you've prepared, but speak to the students without reading because everybody can read, right? And give examples that show you understand the topic. Don't, don't go and read examples from the book. You lose the clever students because they'll say, ah, what is he telling us? After all, he also doesn't know. He's just reading for us, okay? And making it a two-way lecture discussion by asking a few questions, particularly the students who are not attentive. Pay special attention to those. That's a way of reinforcing. When you see that these people are trying to be a bit destructive, they're not attentive. Just ask them questions, if possible, pinpoint them, okay? Ask them so that at least now they can see you are monitoring and then they will change their behavior. Instead of being disruptive, they will try and catch your attention. And then stimulation. Yes, oh, make it more interesting and lively <laughs> by repetition of the main points, stressing, stressing the important ones, pauses to make something more effective, and sharing relevant personal experiences. That is key because you are showing them that you've done it and therefore it's doable even by them. And therefore purposeful body movements, gestures, voice modulations and eye contacts. These are very important stimulants in making your students engage throughout your lecture. Okay? So basically what we are saying is that Teacher is the main one. Teacher teaches. It's not, it's, not the, it's not the blackboard or OHP or PowerPoint. It's you actually who is guiding the learning. So when I say teacher is the main one, I'm not saying that you should be doing all the talking, but you are going to set the stage. Don't put your, black, your, your, your notes on the blackboard or overhead projector or PowerPoint things and you expect them to read from there. No, you are projecting that just to catch the attention so that they can see the relevant things you are doing. But the most important facilitator, not the conveyor of message, but facilitator is you and the activities you engage the learners in. That is important. Okay. Then always be mindful that the teaching flows. Okay. So teaching is a flow of thoughts. It's basically a stream of thoughts. It is a continuous process. Hence, there should be no unwanted interruptions. You are teaching mathematics. Then from there, you start switch off to say, who won between Chelsea and Liverpool? But how does that come into a mathematical subject? Okay. So it's a flow of thoughts. So keep the thoughts continuously flowing. Or if you want to pause or interject on something, use an example that reinforces what you're talking about, okay? It could be a, an example application of the concept, or it could be an example of an organization that used this concept to change the way they look at things. That is okay, because it's within the continuum. But don't bring in something that is totally unrelated. So this is, I, I captured this picture just to emphasize the point that it's a stream of thoughts, okay? So when you are teaching, it's a continuous flow. Don't cut it into pieces 
it will disturb the, the pattern for the students to construct their own knowledge. Okay. Are there any questions on what I've discussed so far? Colleagues, any thoughts? I know people like Mr. Msona, when you are teaching a subject like econometrics, okay, you have an equation there whose variables the students are failing to interpret. How do you get them in to try and understand an equation? You haven't done anything with it. You have just shown them the equation. And there are those variables, okay, that students are grappling with to understand. How do you get them in? Well, I, what I usually do is to speak to each variable, mm -hmm. uh, what is this and what is its mm -hmm. role in the equation. Once they Thank begin you. to see the relationship, they, yes. they will definitely understand. Thank you very much. You know that. Um, one of the key uh, cognitive skills that every every learner tends to pick up very quickly in any subject is actually pattern recognition. Okay? Pattern recognition is definitely an important skill for learning because here is something that comes, okay? Are you able to relate it to something that you've, you've seen before? by observing patterns. So here is something that comes to say when they ask this question, what is likely to follow, you know? So then you start organizing your thoughts around that. I see this, what I should expect is this. Does it follow? Yes, so that's a pattern. So what you've said is true. You explain to them what each of those variables are and what its role in that equation is. So if we reduce the value of this, what do you expect the result to be? If we increase the value of this, what do you expect to be? So they can relate now, okay? If production decreases, okay, then prices will go up. Things like that, so that they can relate the variable and its role in the equation. Thank you very much. I thought that's a very good point you raised. So we look to the last one, which I call summarizing. Summarize your lecture by checking whether you have explained all the learning objectives you have chosen, okay? So you go back, you have explained all these things. So you reflect, okay? In this lecture, we discussed this, we discussed this, we discussed this. So now you check whether you have explained all the learning objectives, okay? So you can check that by doing a question and answer to see if your learners have picked up the key concepts about that objective. Okay. And then you repeat your learning objectives, giving stress on main points. Okay. So I want, I've put this in red deliberately. Please note that summarization is not evaluation or assessment of impact of your lecture. It completes just the delivery of lecture, but does not measure the impact of lecture on the audience. It doesn't. So when you summarize, you are just trying to get them to refocus on what the lecture was all about. It does not give you any evidence of whether the lecture went well or whether the lecture had a positive impact, okay? It just completes the delivery of that lecture, okay? So to know whether your lecture went well or whether you had a positive impact from on, on your learners, you have to engage into the evaluation and assessment processes. Now, this is what I summarize as reflective thoughts. You have to reflect, you had a plan, and then you want to look back and see whether what you planned has been achieved or not, okay? So now this is when you will go to our last uh, learning outcome or learning objective, which is evaluation or assessment. So here, you are now checking the things I'm talking about here, okay? You are trying to see whether you have the positive impact, your lecture has had a positive impact on your students and whether you have met your learning outcomes which you set out to do. So now here you are reflecting, okay? 
impact assessment. You can do it in several ways. It can be one sided by yourself as a teacher. Uh, with experience, I'll tell you that once you finish teaching a topic, you sit back in your office, you can say, mm, did I explain that concept well? You start reflecting, okay? Or if you are, you have time, the benefit of time, you can actually do it with the students, okay? You can do it two-sided. Okay, well, you, you can engage the students just before, after you summarize, just before you, you know, you leave. You, you engage the students, you do it together. Which concepts did you find easy to understand? Which one did? Then the students will give you some kind of feedback. It may not be exact, but it will give you some feedback as to say, oh, here I did a good job that I may not have done. Or it could be done by a third party assessment. So if you want, I mean, in the UK, it was common practice that every semester you actually assess yourselves. You can invite a colleague to attend maybe two, three of your lectures in a semester, or then you also attend two or three of the lectures of a colleague. You both write evaluation reports on each other. Okay, so you, you tell each other objectively the strengths and weaknesses of what they've done in class. Okay, so that tends to cement the practice amongst all of you because each one of you is learning from the others. Okay, so that is impact assessment. What are your experiences, ladies and gentlemen? How do you reflect on whether your teaching has had an impact on the learners? What strategies do you use? We wait until we give them the test eh, or the assignment. Oh, Mr. Churu, sorry, I, 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 I missed your hand. Yes, please, Mr. Churu, go ahead. Uh, the, the better one is the two-sided, mm -hmm. the teacher and the student impact assessment. Sometimes mm -hmm. the students, themselves among themselves they're able to discuss they're able to compare and when you hear those sentiments you get mm -hmm. encouraged it comes through sometimes very informally you find mm -hmm. students in where they are not getting you where they're getting you so you are able to know where to concentrate so where you do it both teacher and the student it becomes a complete assessment yes actually You've hit the nail on the head. The, the, the two-sided one is better, particularly if you've created a very good rapport with your students. It becomes very, very effective because they are free to express themselves to you in a very respectful way. Okay? They will, they will even say, Dr. Njov, there you did very well, but sir, on that aspect, would you kindly repeat it in the next lecture? You know, then they give you that kind of feedback, eh? and at times you also feel that I've shortchanged them, hey, I was running out of time, I didn't manage my time properly, so I didn't spend much time on that. So the two-way sided actually tends to be better because it shows that you care about what you are doing with them, and then they also show that he cares, so if we don't tell him the truth, we may not be helped, you see? So I'm just saying this because these are all possible ways of assessing impact. But what are the other people's thoughts? What do you find more effective? Or what is your practice? Any thoughts? Okay, maybe maybe we're getting tired, but let, let, let me just wrap up and then we see where we are going. Then evaluation, self-designed using understanding of the learning objectives of the lecture as criteria. Now, here we are, we, we are moving towards um, lecturers, I mean students evaluating us, our teaching on every course on a semester by semester basis. This will be automated. 
Okay. Now, one of the things that a lot of people dread is when students criticize their teaching. Is that your view that when students say something about your teaching, they don't like you or what? We have designed a questionnaire where I'm asking the students questions and then the students give us the response. And then you find that the response is not what you expect. Do you feel uh, betrayed, annoyed, or you feel that they are judging you harshly? What, what, what comes to your mind? Any thoughts? Yes, Mr. Skazu. Uh, yes, thanks, Doc. Um, I know it's uh, natural uh, once you get uh, uh, negative feedback uh, mm -hmm. to be affected by it, but uh, uh, sometimes uh, as a, a teacher, since we say that it, to be an effective lecturer or teacher, you must uh, be prepared to learn. So mm -hmm. sometimes uh, negative feedback actually is an opportunity for you to learn. Uh, where you are uh, deficient and you need to improve. Because uh, lecturing, is, I think, is a, a lifelong uh, learning. Uh, you, yes. you never stop uh, learning. So uh, none of us is 100% perfect. Eh? So obviously, there are yes. certain areas in which uh, we are deficient. And those can only be identified if we do get some, some negative feedback from uh, our, our audience, which are the learners. Uh, thank you. Very correct. One of the things that you should do is when you are, uh, when you get the evaluation from the students, be objective towards yourself and towards them. Okay? They are human beings. They have feelings. They know what is good for them and what is not good. So if they if they comment on something that you are not doing well, please reflect on it and see how best you can change one or two things. It may not be the whole thing that you are doing which is wrong. It may just be one thing that you did one day, maybe because you're in a hurry or you had a problem where you're coming from or something like that. And if you reflect objectively, then you find yourself actually benefiting from their evaluations because you've accepted that you are willing to change your behavior because of what, because of the feedback they've given you. That is an important quality to have as a teacher. Never ever, one of the things that I, I don't like is never be moody towards your students. Your students should always see you the same way, day in, day out. Whether you have a bad day at home or whatever, your students should never know you're having a bad day. You, you, once you go in class, you should position yourself for that task only and don't allow anything, any negative thoughts to distract what you're doing in class. So that's professionalism. Okay. So this is what we have. Uh, evaluation, you give learning objectives scores, okay, according to how you think important they are towards the uh, teaching of that topic. You can give points to components of lecture and grade yourself or get it done by the student or third party. Example, you can give yourself 10 marks score for a particular concept. So you say one mark for each set, for, for each, for induction, organizing lesson, reinforcement, stimulation, vocal clarity, expressions, relevance, sequence, preparation of slides, usefulness to the students. So you give yourself excellent 8 to 9, 10 score points, good 6 to 8 average, or you can give students to do that. They can score it. There's no problem. But don't take this as them trying to box you in a corner. No, you're just being objectively. Okay. So this brings me to the worthy points to remember regarding teaching. It's basically a summary of what we've been talking about. Okay, so I'll, I'll share this. And please, I want all of us to you know, share our experiences so that 
we are speaking the same language. So teaching is an art. OK, so I mentioned this, not just reading from a book and reproducing in the classroom. No, teaching is a performance that you have to deliver in class. You have your reading materials, you've got your lecture notes, but the art of teaching does not allow you to go there and sit on a chair and start reading. You are actually demoralizing your learners. OK. Teaching dimensions. In teaching, there are dimensions that develop. Teacher development is mutual with the student development and vice versa. The more you engage the students, the more you learn and the more your students get better and vice versa. OK, so you, at times you can go on and you can go and teach a subject. At the end of it, you might find that some students bring out worthy points which you had actually omitted in your lecture. OK, so that's an additional dimension to your teaching. It's not that those students are clever, but you have stimulated them to, to bring into what they know in context with what you are saying. So that is very important. Teacher development is mutual with the student development and vice versa. OK. Managing the students. That is very important. Don't throw the blame on the students for a failure to create an impact with your lecture. OK. If you fail to make an impact, reflect on your preparation and your delivery style or delivery techniques. OK. You are more mature and more educated on the subject. You plan the subject. Them came into the, into the classroom not knowing what you are going to teach. But now you introduced what you are going to teach and you had a plan for teaching. You have been doing these things. You are more skilled. You are mature. OK, and you can you've got emotional intelligence, which you can manage your emotions. So don't throw the blame on the students for a failure to create an impact with your lecture. Students are immature, less skilled, emotional, and you are mature, more skilled and composed. So the best way is to control the students is by giving them best lectures. Just go and deliver to the best of your ability. And then you find that managing students is not a challenge. And then I'm just sharing this just to reinforce what I'm talking about. I don't have any specific references I can point to, but I packed up. This is packed up from my own knowledge and said five years of teaching experience. Thank you very much. Any questions, any comments, any discussions? Any questions, any suggestions, any discussions? I'll be very happy to share those. I can say one or two things. Yes, do you see? Yes. Um, once upon a time, I did a presentation mm. which uh, which used the red color on the slides. Yes, sir. And I was reprimanded that some people can faint. Oh yes, it means you are shouting, eh? <laughs> yes. So I think as we are preparing the PowerPoint slides, let's avoid the use of. Uh, Red, Red color. color. OK. Yes. Point, point taken, sir. Then uh, the second point is uh, uh, Mr. Chisongo uh, raised the issue of students using gadgets. Yes. While just you are teaching, they are searching issues on the internet and things like that. And should we stop them? So many, many years ago, when I was uh, teaching on, on ACCA, which is a mm -hmm. professional program, yes. on those programs, we give students uh, revision kits which have questions and answers. Right. So a student came with a revision kit to a class, and I didn't know. Right. And so me, I was computing. I was answering the question on the board. And then the student stands up and says, ah, but sir, that answer you have gotten, mm -hmm. 
It's not uh, what the revision kit says. Right. Yeah, so the challenges of, but now what is happening is you, if you, you are in class, you are teaching, a student can just Google a, a topic and they can put you in trouble. So the question of uh, knowing your material, knowing your stuff is extremely important. I don't think that Very we important. can block students from using technology where we have reached. So no. as a lecturer, you just need to be on top of things. Thank you. Thank you very much. That, those are very important points. Yes, it's really important. That preparedness, subject knowledge expert is what you are. And then you incorporate these teaching methods that we are talking about. Then you, you have no problems about worrying what students know or they don't know because you're on top of the subject. Thank you so much, lady and gentlemen. I think we have been on it for nearly two hours. Uh, but this is not going to be the practice, but we are trying to set the stage. So most of these things will be posted ahead, and therefore most of the things we are talking about will run faster than we have we done today. Thank you so much. The beauty is that we have, we have got now enough stuff, I think, starting next week, so the things will flow as planned, I'm sure, once we uh, induct them and the orient them towards the program. We should have experts coming on board. Thank you so much for participating and have a nice weekend to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doc. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.